Right, let's talk about some actual games that happened. So I'm going to break with tradition and mention a non-Welsh or Irish game first. I'm going to talk about Bulls versus Sharks. So a huge event, one of the biggest games in the URC. Uh, and the Bulls made a real statement. They absolutely took apart their uh, local South African rivals in front of a big crowd at the stadium. I think it was well into the mid-20,000s for attendance, which is great to see in a hot day. Again, fell victim to the camera was facing the side of the stadium, which was bathed in sunlight, and it is a heat wave in South Africa, so no one was sat there, so it looked like it was empty, but there wasn't. There was 20-odd thousand people sat on the other stand that the camera wasn't pointing at. So, you know, people... Anyway, I've done that rant too many times already. <laughs> but it was a big game, and the Bulls, we tipped them to do incredibly well this season, and they are not disappointing anybody. And like I said, that Sharks team was packed full of Yuretsa Beths and every Springbok you could want. And the Bulls were like, yeah, cool, and just absolutely destroyed them, playing some great rugby and just formidable. I can't see them losing at home for the entirety of this season. And I think they're going to be there or thereabouts come finals time in the URC, to be honest. So that was the exciting game. I'm now going to quickly run through the Welsh regions, and then I will let you two get into the meat and the bones of the Connor versus Leinster game. So, like I said, I was at um, Cardiff Farms Park to take in Cardiff versus Scarlets, a win for the Scarlets, a morale boosting win, but I'd say from a Scarlets point of view, a lot of the problems that we've had were still very much present and correct. Our set piece got taken apart, both line out and scrum, and our kicking game still has not made an appearance this season. So Cardiff managed to draw us into a set piece game in the first 20 and a kicking game in the third 20 and won both of those periods, but we just ran everything and Yoan Lloyd in particular, just was like, yeah, no, give me the ball, and was just making breaks from his own 22 all, all over the place. Cardiff down a man after losing Ellis Jenkins, which I, I think was a fair one. But if anybody ever has the chance to attend a rugby match in Cardiff, I'd really go for it because it's a great day out. Um, it, it, the locations, both Cardiff Farms Park and the Principality, are right in the middle of the city. There's Spent you literally time. Brilliant. Yeah, you, you fall into a pub on the way out. And just don't go when it's minus two like I did. And it will be, uh, like I said, a great day. So no excuse for not getting out and just enjoying the rugby. Uh, other two results, Ospreys in a low scoring game against Benison. Benison won. I think it's a lot closer than a lot of Osprey fans were fearing, though, because Benison went full strength and Osprey sent the kids. Toby Booth said it wasn't the kids, but it was. Um, and yeah, it, I think it will be another one of those um, results that we look back at the end of the season and say, Do you know what, that wasn't so bad. Um, but Benetton racking up the wins and I still have them down to be in the playoffs come the end of the season. And then finally, Dragons took a hefty beating off the Lions down in South Africa in their final total game. You looked at the result and I think it was something like 49-22, something like that. And you think, oh, that's not so bad. Kept it under 50. And then you see that the Lions had a player sent off in the first half. <laughs> and you go, oh, OK, maybe it's not so good. And then you watch the highlights. And talk about gift wrapped tries. The Dragons just gave. I think Jamie broke it down on rap and said, yeah, it was five out of the Lions, six tries were came from knock-ons from the Dragons where the Lions player just picked it up and ran it in. It's not really good enough, to be honest. And it, Dragons fans are very much sick of hearing the same old excuses and same old lines that come out from the captain and the coach at the end of the game, like, oh, we need to improve our accuracy. We need to be playing at this level, blah, blah, blah. Well, how many times can we learn this lesson, guys? But anyway... Scarlets uh, are now top of the Welsh Shield, and that's all that matters. So that's out of the way. Ender, call the police. There was a robbery in Galway. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, it was, yeah, it was a really tough watch at the end, but I thought Connacht did, like, I think Connacht, despite, like, the, I think they're in eighth now um, at the moment, just behind Benetton, or sorry, just behind Ulster. And I I, I really feel like they, they should be higher in the table. Um, like despite this loss, and I know it wasn't the Leinster's, you know, it wasn't I know it wasn't Leinster's first team, and it was, yeah, I just I just really do think Len, like Connacht are in a good position, and they're playing really good rugby. They're throwing more passes than any other team. They're offloading. They do kick. They kick quite a lot, but they kick smartly. They you know they keep the ball um in play. They don't just click kick for lineouts. And like if you look at this performance, like Connacht were were down um quite early on and they came back and and a lot of that was down to Hansen. But also like if you look at Connacht's three scores within this game, they all started from within their own half. 
And I think that just shows you how exciting they are and, 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 and the type of players that they have and the type of game plan that they have. And it just shows that they're they're willing to run it from, from anywhere, but not necessarily like their own 22. Like, if you, like Connacht under Pat Lamb would, you know, famously run from anywhere, like in terms of like their 22 or like close their line. Whereas Connacht at the moment under Wilkins are a bit bit smarter than that. Like they do run the ball from inside their own half, but they, you know, they do play smart rugby. Rugby, they do clear the lines when they need need to. They've got an excellent scrum half in Caelan Blade, who's who's able to box kick quite well. Um, Connacht's scrum was was very dominant in this game. Like Tyg Furlon, like towards the end of the game, Tyg Furlon came on and Keen Healy came on, and Connacht were just winning. Like there was a reset after reset, but eventually the ref kind of gave in and, and just gave the, the a couple of penalties to Connacht. I think he was dead right, but like they were completely dominant in that facet of the game. And I think that's a really strong point. And and they were quite good at stealing the line out, you know, opposition line out, uh, which is what they've been good at all season. But in this game, the line out just capitulated. It was so frustrating. I think there were five losses in a row or something. And unfortunately, um, in the what 81st minute, um, when Connacht had done really well, you know, won a won a scrum penalty against Leinster only a couple of minutes left in the clock, kicked the ball to the sideline, and then the ball went in. Yeah, crooked throw on the line out, and Leinster, of course, yeah, run in. Um, really, really frustrating. But yeah, they, they, they just think they, they, they do need to figure some things out, but I just don't want to be overly negative. Like, I think this is one that Connacht probably deserved to win. Like, they just need to cut out some of these silly mistakes. Like, I remember they were camped in their own line during the first half, and they did really well, well to hold out Leinster. And then they eventually won a penalty, but that penalty was reversed because Hurley Langton um, during a scrap grabbed somebody else's scrum cap and then, yeah, the ref saw it and reversed the, the penalty. And that was really, like, that was a really tough moment for Connacht. And then similarly, you know, um, was it against the Bulls where they had a chance to go for their fourth try just to get a, you know, that that bonus point. But of course, the penalty was reversed because there was ch- back chat to the ref. Like, stupid things like that, they really need to get out of their game. But Overall, I think that they're definitely going in, in the right direction. Like line out aside this game, I think the line out's been good this season. The scrum's excellent. They've got some absolute superstars. They've got Matt ha- Mac Hansen back, 11 defenders beaten, 143 meters gained, two try assists, three clean breaks. Like he's a superstar. Um, and now we've got Bundy coming back this Friday as well against Bordeaux. So it's not all doom and gloom, but it's a game they should have won. And it wasn't Leinster's first team was far from it but the foundations are there to, I think to go to go pretty far this season what are your thoughts I've been going on a bit there uh, Catherine but what are your thoughts from a Leinster perspective I think I think you're harsh on your own team right I think this team kind of gave up its big stars to the World Cup they're only just back in assimilated and sure we're missing Bundy um Hansen as I was I'm sorry I was talking across there Hansen is debuting at full back on Saturday night and looked like a man possessed so it's it's a weird thing to watch Connacht over the years. I certainly well remember, like it was yesterday, the 2016 Celtic Cup final, where the Celtic League final in Edinburgh, when you absolutely hammered us. And I think they're kind of two steps away from being the psychological killer team, right? And all that needs is a bit of guidance and your frontliners back and in command and control. Um, I'd rather not focus too much on my own team stealing victory at the death, because I think that was a blip. I was really concerned and it's a concern that's carried over from the World Cup as to line out and set piece and scrum. I just think something has gone wrong. Um, I'm not sure that Leo is the person with the steady hand on the tiller. It's not really his job to do that stuff. He's the overall, you know, the executive and the DOR needs to take responsibility. And of course, that person has been absent and has just arrived back after a month long bus tour of South Africa with a trophy. So, like, I, I think our chickens are coming home to roost much faster than we expect. And of course, looking forward to Sunday, we play La Rochelle in La Rochelle. I'll be flipping amazed if we come away from that without any losing bonus points, let alone anything else. And I think really, you look at somebody as good and as sharp as Frawley, and perhaps now that the news today with Harry Byrne being out injured until the new year, perhaps Frawley now slots into that 10 slot that he should have occupied from probably the start of his professional career really at Leinster and of course never was able to because Sexton was there ahead of him and that maybe is the one bright spark for us that injury albeit really unfortunate forces that positional shift so we see Frawley 
at his pivotal best. But I think there's much more questions for me than happy answers for you, Enda, based on what happened on Saturday. We talked about uh, the uh, attendance at um, Musgrove Park there. So Munster put 40 points on Glasgow and it was a game that they seemed to have won pretty early on. Did either of you manage to catch much of this? That's one for you, Enda. I'm yeah, I caught the I caught most of the first half and a little bit of second half. Um, it was such a fast start by Munster for me. Um, Glasgow were still on that plane. I thought they were very poor. Like I think Munster were really good in that first half, and I think they're a team that you enjoy watching now. Like the offloads, the passes, the variety to their game. They've got some really good young and upcoming players. They got Tom Ahern, Crowley, Coombs, Casey. You can like just to name but a few. And again, it's just. It's great. Like I, I don't know about you guys, but when you when you think about Graham Round, you wouldn't maybe necessarily associate him with this offloading fast paced game. And I think it's just it's brilliant. And I think he's a really popular figure down in Munster. And I think that's really important. Um, but for me also, yeah, just in that game, Glasgow were definitely off the pace. Um, but yeah, Munster, I think are they're looking really strong at the moment. I do still wonder if their front row is strong enough. And uh, to go all the way uh, in Europe this season, if we can still call it Europe, we probably can't. And uh, we'll call it EPCR, even though there's Europe in there, but any European in there. Um, I'm definitely calling it Heineken Cup. <laughs> yeah, we'll just call it the Heineken Cup. Or the, yeah, we're not, we, we refuse to follow that, that I word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, so I think I just put, they, they have got Ollie Eager in, who looks like a really good signing. He's Irish qualified, of course he is. Um, so I think, yeah, Munster were, were very good. Um, Ulster, not so much though. Just touching on that game, I think they lost what twenty four or twenty seven twenty four at home to Edinburgh. Did either of you guys get a chance to watch this game? Or oh, Jesus, yeah. I mean, I I tried my best to sit through the whole thing, but it. it's terrible. That's a team in real trouble. And mm. I I'm great, I suppose, stu- student of psychology and sport and recent academic stuff I've done has led me down that path a bit. It, it really looks like they are a crowd of fellows with no leaders. No on pitch leaders. Um, Dan McFarlane seems to be furious the whole time about the yeah. fact that the team didn't perform in training. Well, uh, perhaps one should look at oneself, Dan, is, is the answer to that. You contrast that with the point you've made about Graham Rowntree, who more and more seems to be to becoming a leader. And you need to be a leader of men, particularly in those Irish provinces where they're so guided by the cult of the personality. And, you know, you miss couple of big personalities in the Ulster setup and suddenly they are looking absolutely rudderless. I mean, they were trying to lose that game. And I've, you feel really sorry for guys like Stephen Ferris and the other lads around him who have played and won trophies with Ulster and I have to watch and commentate on this because they look abject and really lost. You know, and, and for a team with the calibre of players they have, everyone has to stand up and take accountability and people aren't and you'd have to look at them and think Jesus they really contrived to lose it yeah and they've been going for a good few years now with that like for a long yeah. time now without any trophies so I think it's about time you know they they pull things together and I know they have a massive injury list now at the moment and um, there are murmurings now obviously about McFarland the rumours go around about him of course but he's in contract with Ulster till 2025 I believe so. I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought those comments after the game were were quite poor. Talking about like you always look at yourself. Like you wouldn't hear Rog saying something like that. You certainly wouldn't hear Pete Wilkins, uh, who's the current Connacht uh, coach. He's excellent as well. I didn't know much about him until this season. I'm, I've listened to him now every week in the media, and he's he's really articulate. He's a really smart guy, and you can tell that that players are playing for him. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I don't think I don't see Ulster going anywhere uh, this season, unfortunately. And they've also signed kids off, who must be wondering what the hell he's walked himself into. Imagine that. He's probably checked his bank account, though, and he's probably got happy days. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine arriving into Belfast and it being dark at four o'clock in the afternoon? I mean, God love him. God almighty. He's probably looking at Blair Kinghorn getting um, Edinburgh 100 grand from Toulouse and just going, oh, I'm over here. Uh, right, last URC game then, Stormers versus Zebra. I didn't manage to catch much of it, but 31-7 to, Ze- to, not to Zebra, to the Stormers. Stormers with their spring box back, Manny was back, hashtag Team Manny, and Willemse was back, got on the score sheet. I think you kind of look at it and go, with the context that you have to the view the URC with now, with these South African tours, you'd say 31-7 isn't so bad, <laughs> really. And this is... 
like you didn't get anything out of the game, but you have to say there's a lot of teams are going to get beat by a lot more down there. Yeah. And that's so. testament to, to, to Zebra as well. Like they're on 11 points now at the moment, which is equal to what they had at the end of last season and more than they had at the end of the 2021 to 2022 season, which is just bonkers to me. Um, but I think that that like that that shows how far they've come on. Like they've a win this season, they've a draw, and I think that that's important. And they're yeah, this league to me so far this season has just been so competitive. Um, but yeah, the Stormers do look off though at the same time. Like this, like I know that they were traveling for four weeks. Well, they were at four games. I think I think it was at least four weeks. Yeah, they were traveling. Um, so yeah, but they were probably on the road for maybe for longer than that. But yeah, I, yeah, I think it's yeah, we'll see. I think we'll see now the South African teams as they play these home. Like even the Lions are putting massive scores up on on teams. Um, but I think we'll we'll see the the South African teams really now creep up that table. Maybe not so much the Sharks, but maybe that's for another pod. Yeah, 